like I've been saying, some people I know are like me. It takes a while to generate a decent question um, because you need to mull it over in your mind. So now is the time to have mulled that question and to express it. So there's been a lot of really challenging uh, content throughout this weekend. Uh, and I know from speaking to many of you that it's led to a lot of reflection, um, especially in your free times, and a lot of thinking about what this means, not just in some abstract sense, but what it might mean for me and us and my community and, and all the rest. And so feel free to ask any type of question about community and, and the other themes that have been touched on. Um, and don't feel like there's a stupid question or an, a question that's too obvious. Um, chances are somebody else is thinking of a similar question. So, who would be brave to ask the first question? There you go. Yeah. Um, and to, and to, I just I want just to make sure that you're hearing those questions, or do I need to repeat them? Yeah, cool. Okay, so just to paraphrase that question, how do you build a relationship with your neighbours if they don't trust you, they don't know you, that kind of, and they don't want to? Uh, I think, firstly, if they don't want to, then they don't want to, and that's that's life, eh? Like, not everyone likes us, and that's, you know, quite hard as, as people. I find that quite hard personally. But I think what happens over time is that people start to like you. <laughs> um, yeah, so in our particular street, um, people are just really attracted. They're attracted to people who um, are loving, who are listening, and who are genuinely interested. Um, having said that, sometimes if you've been um, privy to some often conflict actually, like you know people yelling at their kids or a situation of domestic violence, sometimes if, um, if we've intervened, there can be a, um, an awkwardness in the relationship from then on if those people actually don't want to be friends and if they feel ashamed about what has happened. So we have had experience of that, particularly in council housing where, yeah, we've heard a domestic and I've gone and, you know, intervened and, yeah, the, the ongoing relationship has been quite awkward, so that does happen too. Yeah. But I think on the whole... Um, People tend to like loving, peacemaking people. Yeah. Often it's a matter of not really understanding or not knowing, you know, what is this big group here, you know. Um, who are these people? You know, they're different, they dress different, they live up there. And, um, just to find many ways to reach out, to have an open door, to be out in the community. Um, we have one sister who has joined from Austra Australia, from Inverell, who came because the community members uh, went to her door with donuts and knocked, and that started a, a long path, but the door was open a crack, and then it was wider, and then it was wider. And she is now a sister in our community. So I think finding ways to just bridge the sort of unknown. Similarly, I would say a, a plate of Bickies goes a long way. We had a neighbor family with some small kids. They were constantly throwing things over the wall, um, destroying our vegetables, uh, just uh, basic uh, mischief. And uh, it's easy to, to try to ignore something or get angry or those types of things. Well, come around Christmas, we said, hey, let's just take a uh, plate of Bickies over and invite them to a carol singing and little candlelight ceremony we're going to do. So we went ahead and did that. And lo and behold, uh, the mother and three or four of the 
good old chaps came over to the candle lighting. And in fact, they enjoyed it so much, we had a beautiful um, sort of double helix um, wooden type Christmas tree. And uh, <clears throat> during the evening, people said uh, wishes and prayers and lit a candle and, and these little kids really got into it. So much so that after the tree was lit, um, they blew out the bottom rows of candles so that they could light them again. <laughs> and <laughs> that was just great. So it can be done with patience, with Bickies. Uh, for us, Margaret's great at baking and does all of those kind of things, and that's fantastic. Uh, for me, uh, it's gardening. Um, when we lived uh, in Kings Cross uh, in the middle of Sydney, um, uh, I had a little uh, pot plant garden in the backyard of our apartment. Um, and uh, then in other apartments we lived in Sydney, I always found a space where I could uh, plant a few things and hang out there. And there is something about a garden that actually stops people. They will, people who have never looked at you or smiled at you before will stop and they'll say, oh, what's that? Or, well, gee, that looks nice. Uh, or they'll just pause with you. And it is one of the most amazing things for me that this happens. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's also this sense of, uh, you know, the technical word is the liminal space, that space that is no one's space. Sitting on your veranda, if you have a veranda, sitting on your front doorstep, uh, being out in your front yard as much as you can. And uh, when people walk past saying hi and saying hi to them, you know, a hundred times uh, um, in our street, we've been able to do that with quite a lot of people. There's still one family, they go past, their heads are always down, we say hi, they might grunt back, but that's it. <laughs> we still haven't broken through with them. But, you know, it happens. But, but for me, uh, gardening is, is just the most wonderful thing. And it's also a very, you know, particularly if you're living in apartments or in, in uh, you know, in those difficult kind of areas, to have a little bit of creation there in the middle of all that hardness. Uh, it's good for you, it's good for other people, and it, it works great in, in my experience. Sorry, just one more thing from me. When we um, lived in council housing, we were asked by the city council to form a tenants committee. And we moved into this, into this neighbourhood, into this block of flats, and actually we, we hadn't done our homework. We didn't realise that there'd been a series of tenants committees that had been formed and functioning over a number of years, and that every single one of them had, had fallen apart due to people embezzling funds and lots of different power dynamics at play in a, in a block of council flats. And when we moved in, we started this tenants committee and it became clear very quickly that there was one person who wanted to become the chairperson of that committee and who had a deep, deep distrust of us as Urban Vision. And he was someone who, who did go on a personal rampage of, um, yeah, really being quite against us and quite verbal in that and quite physically aggressive at times as well. And it was interesting because we got to a point where um, there was just conflict every single meeting, um, some of it quite intense. And I said to Tom one day, I said, you know what, I think you need to take Alan out for a coffee every fortnight. And Tom's like, what the heck? I said, yeah, I think you need to take him out and you just need to be his friend. And it's interesting because Tom did that. And over the course of months, a deep friendship started to develop with this person who, um, you know, our team is still in existence in those block of council flats and every single one of them has a relationship with this person and, you know, he's a real, um, a real advocate now of who we are and I think there's something about just um, confronting darkness with light and confronting evil, not that he's evil, but this, you know, this force, confronting it with love and listening and presence and genuine interest in the person, I think that can be really transformative and it can really, um, Jesus wins people over. Yeah. Tom. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> We've been waiting for this. <laughs> One of the things that, uh, that I have particularly appreciated about um, speaking and hearing from 
some of you, is, uh, is the history that you guys cover. And, and the many um, uh, different ways in which you have joined community, uh, and the stories behind that, and the challenges that came with your time when you joined. I'm interested to know what you perceive as some of the challenges that are unique to this younger, newer generation. Uh, what do you see as the issues that they are grappling with in joining the community? That it may be different from when you find it. Well, probably the first I'd identify is simply the um, the obsession with technology and in our church community we've taken the position that technology actually separates people so there's this um, this very well marketed idea that technology connects people and and yes it does you can be in a New York subway talking to someone in China but what about the person right next to you and it was really striking coming down on the train. Uh, it was really like one big happy family. Um, there was a grandmother knitting. There were grandparents reading to their kids. And for re whatever reason, maybe because the reception was so poor, um, I don't know if there was anybody on that train wrapped up in their technology. And so I think it's a, a huge hurdle. And uh, some younger ones here would have to agree or disagree. Um, to come out of that bubble that, that you're just so wrapped up in and actually get to know the person beside you. And in community, of course, that's absolutely vital that we make those, those connections one to another. So I can imagine that would be an enormous hurdle to, to physically actually detach yourself from your technology. It's to the point where you might as well embed it in your skin. Um, and I, I look around me in the world today, and I just marvel at the multi-billion dollar marketing that has convinced so many people that they cannot walk down a street without looking down like this. Do they say good morning? No. Do they recognize that a human being made in the image of God has actually passed them on the street? No. Unbelievable. We should really question the multi-billion dollar marketing that has convinced an entire population around the globe that we need these stupid little gadgets to function. We're forgetting our humanity. So I think that's, I think that's a big, big issue. Maybe others have other ideas. It's, um, One of the things that has really impressed me about the younger generation, I've, I've read some research that, uh, that looks at the, the values uh, that, that, that many young people hold. And uh, they, uh, the research that I've read uh, tends to show that they are uh, less materialistic, uh, they are more altruistic, they are more uh, concerned with relationships, than, uh, than at least I had come to expect. Um, and uh, when I look around at what is happening, I'm tremendously impressed by the number of young people that have started up these, these incredible social justice things, uh, not because they're Christian or whatever, it's simply because this is something they want to do for the world. Uh, you know, these two young guys in Brisbane who started up the... Um, uh, um, 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 laundry <laughs> wouldn't come out. The, the laundry service uh, for young people, but you know, all the time I'm seeing young people who've started up this this um, uh, this charity and are supporting schools in Kenya or um, uh, and, and so on. So um, I I don't and I might be really wrong in this, but you know, my perception is that. Uh, the, the, there are so many young people out there who are really wanting to make a commitment and really wanting to make a change in this world. Um, I sense that it's the young people who are more concerned about the environment uh, than, than many of us are. 
uh, many of us older ones are. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, somehow we've got to be there encouraging them. I don't see that it being a problem for them getting engaged in community. Um, I just think they need more encouragement and more recognition for what they're doing. But that, that's the perception I have, and I'd be really interested to hear other people's uh, response to that. Yeah. Well, I, I would definitely agree with that. You asked what, what challenges, so that's why I responded to that particular one, which I, I definitely hold to. Um, but absolutely, wherever there's young people, there is hope. And uh, this planet is full of young people, full of energy, and, uh, and therefore there's that hope. But I, I think we will have to overcome some of the distances created um, by our technology. The other thing it does it, it, um, is distraction. And, and in terms of communal living, you have to find, um, and Henry Nouwen says this beautifully, that, that inner solitude so that your solitude can meet the other's solitude. And through that, you can really um, have that sense of being. And, and that's where that, that challenge comes. If there's too much distraction, we can't actually even hear that still small voice that's urging us to action, urging us, and, and like you're saying, you know, to all kinds of creativity. Um, so, just that, that one other thought. I think one of, the, um, one of the challenges of technology for young people is actually around feeling really um, scattered within themselves. Um, I don't know, those of you who are on Facebook, as I am, have probably seen like, you know, there'll be a video of a, a cat, <laughs> usually doing something really random, and then the next thing in the news feed is, is a video of a child being pulled out of the rubble in Syria. And you know, what's happening for young people is that they're flicking from one set of images to the next, all of which, some of which are completely just ridiculous and stupid, and then some of which are just profoundly disturbing. And young people, they don't know what to do with that. And there's this depression and anxiety that is, that is filling their lives as a result of just this exposure to things that don't go together and I think for young people, there is actually a, a search and a deep longing for holism, <laughs> like a whole of life something. And I think the challenge is for us to actually have something to show these young people, to have something to invite them into. And so there's a sense of, okay, here is something that I can like, you know, put my life into and offer back. But I think they genuinely just have far, far too many options. Like I'm not young in that sense, I'm not a millennial, but I feel that, you know, all the options and do I click that, that letter that sends a letter to Donald Trump, do I watch this video of a cat jumping through a hoop, you know, can I stomach seeing a, a baby being pulled out of the rubble in Syria, like it's just, it's just too much for young people and yeah, I think we can't blame them and yeah, we need to be offering, and Jesus and community life, and you know, that offers an alternative, but we can't blame them for not living an alternative if, if they don't have anything offered to them. But the hope is that then when the underlying dissatisfaction, um, they will turn for what is real, what is true, and that is where, you know, they'll turn to Jesus and they'll look for where they can find and that's where we come in with our you know just sticking to the gospel and living it out and so they can see that there is a way to live a genuine true life uh, I wonder in light of that and, and what's been said and some of the challenges for younger people uh, which are not necessarily unique to them but is characteristic of them, maybe. Um, what expectations do you have of young people who might come into your communities in relation to those issues that they might face? How maybe expectations not the right word, but hopefully you know what I mean. Like what what are you hoping that young people might commit to in joining your community? Well, first is uh, a commitment to Christ because uh, Christ is the game changer and he can liberate from, from every addiction. Uh, 
um, from every sin. And so really, that, that is the, the beginning and foundation of all I would want to offer. Everything else is a gift um, from the Spirit. And um, to draw only, only Christ, I, I love in the, the letter, first letter of John, he simply says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Just wonderful simplicity in that. And that's what I hope that, um, that anyone crossing our doorstep would feel, first and foremost, the love of Christ, drawing them in. And then beyond that, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, which um, we're there to foster, to encourage. Um, if there's something there that needs confronting, the Holy Spirit does that as well. Um, and changes lives, and uh, that continues to happen, and we, we praise God for that. And change is something that would come with, with anybody coming into the community, and we always need change. We always need to find new ways and new streams. So, um, you know, that is also something that we look forward very much to with, with young people, with anybody that comes. And it has happened over and over again through our history. So I guess for Urban Vision, we have quite clear kind of lines of entry for young people. So, well, for anyone. So we have a process of um, formation and people joining Urban Vision would um, do three years of formation, but every year they would choose whether or not to move on to the next stage. Um, but I think it's important to say that in Urban Vision, we, you know, we live by this, by this covenant, so we have these practices that hold us, but we have space within us as a movement to hold people in various stages of faith crisis. So you could have a conversation with 10 Urban Vision people and the spectrum of um, where they are at in their faith would, would be quite different but we do have a commitment to growing in intimacy with Jesus, but that will look different for different people. And I know for me, um, you know, I've gone through multiple stages of, of faith and I, and I also don't feel like it's, you know, about getting to this point. I feel like there's a return constantly to the, to the essentials and the basics. You know, do I believe in this stuff, you know? Can I trust God? And do I really believe in this kingdom that we talk about? So yeah, we have clear lines of entry but we also, yeah, we create um, a space where it's okay to question. Yeah, in our team, we, we encourage questions and, and honesty, and it's okay. Um, but that the charism of urban vision, though, is not sacrificed by that. You know, we can hold it, but we remain in an apostolic kind of, kind of movement, but there's space. I guess as far as um, Wellspring is concerned, um, when most people connect with us, uh, they connect because uh, they, because we're not a church, uh, we're a parachurch organisation. Um, when people connect with us, they connect because they feel as though there is something is out of balance in their own church life, uh, and that they see that well, uh, Wellspring. Uh, uh, tries to help people to maintain a balance in their Christian life, uh, a balance between the, the spirituality, prayer, spirituality, um, uh, commitment to Jesus, and uh, also uh, activism, working for peace and justice, uh, the environment, reconciliation, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, so uh, most people who've come have either been in a church that you know, has been so committed to, to evangelism and outreach um, and uh, while people felt that was important, they also felt there was more they wanted in their life and uh, it was a peace and justice focus that was part of Wellspring that attracted them and the keeping of this balance uh, in their lives. Uh, and I guess that's what um, we'd be truly hoping for young people who might come into our community that they also would experience this balance. Um, uh, because I think that the young also experience those same tensions. Many young people are in um, 
highly evangelistic churches uh, uh, which pay no attention or little attention to the justice issues or they're in churches that are very committed to, to, to justice uh, um, and uh, not so much attention to spirituality. So we hope that by connecting with us uh, we would be able to help them to grow in this balanced uh, Christian life. Sorry, I just want to uh, comment. Uh, I, I do agree with, um, with Neil. Actually what you are inviting anyone to is to continue their search. So let, let's, let's go on this search together because that, that is what church community is all about. Uh, you never arrive. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a constant search. And, mm -hmm. and that's really exciting um, to be part of that because every person who comes, comes in um, brings their own search with them. Mm -hmm. And that enlivens, um, it, it, uh, it encourages, it um, challenges, does all those great things so that we all continue on this search, someone used the phrase once, um, divine dissatisfaction, and I just love that term because if that divine dissatisfaction dies in you, then you're spiritually dead. And so with every new current that, that enters the church community, um, we learn and, and continue that search and are enlivened by it. Uh, I think D Doug was first, yeah. yeah what is, what is it, context that I think is new for us and, and have you reflect on, on the challenges it presents and it, it arises really from the uh, revelations over the last two decades of the failure of institutions in dealing with being accountable in dealing with issues of sexual abuse, particularly of children. And it's an institutional failure which has been focused to a certain extent on the churches, but it's quite clear that the same manifestation was there in a range of other institutions. And my take on what I've heard is that the failure was centred around uh, the protection of the institution above the person that they were caring for. And I think that presents tremendous problems for the churches who, who have been visibly implicated with it. Uh, so, just noting that on the other hand, that despite that, um, church welfare organisations have largely retained their stature within um, Australia in terms of their, what they stand for, what they practice. So, I, I mean, I, I have just found this profoundly troubling, and I don't know about <coughs> um, listening to the reports from the Royal Commission that uh, just been, been gutting, and it, it presents tremendous challenges for, for, for Christians, and also the background against we, which we will be leaving out of them. I was just trying to sketch the context and just would like to hear your reflections on the challenges it represents. Um, so, so I just, just for the strength. strength. Um, the, the question related to the issue of uh, child sex abuse uh, within churches and other institutions uh, and the Royal Commission that's happened around that in Australia over recent years. Um, and asking for the panel's reflections on uh, the challenges that we face in the midst of those issues and that situation. Obviously uh, many layers to that question. Um, you see that I'm, I'm wearing a cross, so that, that in itself presents a challenge because I've not seen one news uh, media article on the Royal Commission or anything related that doesn't show a cross or a rosary or a church or and that 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 implicates all of us um, in a very subtle way I, I think it's deliberate um, there is a a section of the media that would love to see the the church torn apart um, so that juxtaposition is not accidental so that's that's the one challenge because people look at my cross um, having seen a media story in the morning. 
and, and because of that juxtaposition, um, they may think differently about me. So that, that's on the one level. Um, more importantly, though, I think the, the way to address that issue and, and actually all issues in church community goes right back to, in, in our history, um, the first really big crisis um, that enveloped um, the small group that had gathered in, in Germany. And the issue was um, whether there should be a strong economic foundation for this thing or whether they should rely on faith. Um, so kind of classic conflict. And uh, one, one faction actually took control of the, of the, uh, the printing and publishing work and, um, and essentially left the community with, with that, um, basically taking the economic foundation out from under. Uh, so that was obviously, that was two years into the history and was a, a very, very painful and very learning experience. Out of that experience um, grew the simple rule that we have, and it's the only rule that you'll see up on our walls. And that, that stems from Matthew 18, and it is simply a commitment we all make to address um, directly um, to another person anything we feel that is wrong, um, should be done differently. Um, and that, that direct address um, is the most important way to safeguard against all manner of, of ill. Um, and throughout our history where that commitment to that simple rule is strong, um, much can be avoided. Um, where it's weak, um, then you have uh, interpersonal issues, um, you know, tensions and all that. So I think that's the, the fundamental commitment to, to Christ, to the love of Christ, to the love to one another that, that goes directly in love and um, to point out something that has rubbed me wrong. Um, I might be wrong. So to go in humility is very, very important. But I think um, without that, that really rock bottom commitment to each other, um, all manner of ill can, can grow. I mean, I just, uh, I mean, obviously you're not from Australia, yeah, so yeah. is there, but is there an equivalent dynamic in New Zealand uh, in yeah. any way? Yeah. yeah, totally, totally. And I mean, I don't feel like that is a question. I think like you said, you are painting a picture of, you know, a context that all of us exist within as followers of Jesus. Um, and yeah, I, I guess for us in Urban Vision, um, probably the challenge for us is around um, becoming aware of um, children in unsafe situations in our neighbourhoods. And so we do have processes of, um, of uh, reporting that stuff, and it's so complex, obviously, and sometimes your own personal safety is or the safety of your family is compromised at very, very challenging circumstances. So we, we do have some, some um, frameworks around how we deal with that. I guess as a woman, <laughs> what, what, my, I, what I love about Urban Vision is that our women are powerful. Our women have power, and um, not power for power's sake, but the community is framed and held by women as well as men, but kind of by women because we're the ones in our neighbourhoods most of the time um, being that, being that um, sharer of, of home and, and life. Um, and so I think that is something that can keep us safe, having women at the, um, at the heart of what we do but also at the heart of the, the framing and the, the guiding of the thing itself. Um, so I think that's an incredibly important, important thing that we, we hold to in Urban Vision. Urban Vision women are fierce. <laughs> it's a scary thing, I tell you. <laughs> I 
I mean, this is uh, not, really, not really a direct answer to your question, but it, the whole issue, there are some issues that concern me that lie behind so much uh, of what's going on in our society that gets manifested in things like uh, the, the sexual abuse and so on. That I'm concerned that our society is such a society of outrage now that we become outraged about everything and it's important to become outraged about certain things but we become outraged without any, uh, any acceptance of restorative justice. Um, and, uh, you know, we lived in, 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 when we lived in Sydney, we lived quite close uh, to where uh, a man who had, uh, uh, was a pedophile, ha who had um, be been imprisoned for a number of years and was finally released, uh, they, they could find nowhere in the community where he could live. Um, he was a complete non-person. Now, you know, that yes, it was outrageous what he did, but we just kept on the rage um, and w there's no place for forgiveness or restoration um, and, and the whole question of, of how we factor forgiveness into into things when bad things occur in the church or anywhere. Um, that, that, that they're the things that concern me, that our society now identifies these problems. And, and, and some of the problems that we've identified, you know, I'm of an age where, where those things were simply part of the culture. They might have been wrong then, but they were part of the culture. And, but today, they are now completely outrageous, you know. They might have been wrong then, but they weren't outrageous back then. And so how we, how we live in this society and getting the balance in our, in our lives uh, between uh, being angry and, and, and seeking justice and then allowing justice to work through to, to forgiveness and restoration and those things, it, that, it's, that seems to be very difficult in our society. And, and uh, it's one of the areas in which I, uh, you know, I sometimes begin to lose hope that we will ever come back to any sense of balance in our society. Uh, and saying all of this, I don't want to you know, suggest that I in any way condone things that have been going on, but mm. we're just not managing them in the right way when they occur, in my opinion. And Neil, this, this relates pretty strongly to something that Tom was talking about on Friday night when Tom was talking about uh, restorative justice and it, it did raise a question for me at the time um, that is maybe a good time just to explore briefly now and and that's that the Christian community well at least the communities we are a part of where we um, we try to practice this idea of restorative justice but that comes obviously intent into tension with uh, other Christian groups but also sometimes the legal system itself um, so what how ought we to deal with situations like the one you're talking about where the kind of justice that we might seek might actually be in some ways in contradiction with what the law of the land uh, seeks? Not that, you know, this man had been out of jail, but you understand the tension I'm talking about. I think you need to encapsulate that more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. More condensed, condensed um, form. So, what? Uh, how can Christian communities embody uh, that alternative understanding of justice, of restorative justice, when that bring that may bring us into tension and conflict with the authorities or the community, the wider community? Well, I. Uh, I honestly don't know, other than to say that, I mean, that we, we find ourselves in conflict a lot of the time about the, the laws of the land uh, that we consider to be, to be unjust and we, we, we do our best to, 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 to find ways of changing them um, while at the same time living uh, as best we can um, uh, to, to continue to follow Jesus and to and to be, be true uh, to, to the gospel. I don't think that's a very adequate answer and someone may have a better one. 
I'm not saying this is better, but it, it also goes to, um, to Doug's question. Um, I hope that the church community can be a place where broken people find other broken people, that, that there's a space to absorb um, pain and hurt. Um, we know that, that Jesus did that um, better than, than anyone else will ever do uh, because that's really why he came. And to make, make spaces for all kinds of brokenness um, so that, that all who come can feel this is a place where, where I, can, I can be um, regardless of my past um, on, on both sides of this very painful issue. And the two of us can certainly witness to a, a space like that in, in Melbourne, um, a small congregation called Friends of Dismas, uh, Dismas being the thief on the cross who was invited into paradise. And so this is a gathering of, of ex-offenders um, with a, a beautiful pastoral couple. And we love that space um, because there our own brokenness is joined with many others. And, and that is a space where, where Christ is present. Absolutely no question about that. I work for Salvo's counselling, and so I have to see just for the oh. if you could go. Um, I work for Salvo's Counselling and so I come across, um, you know, information and situations on the topics that we're discussing, you know, on a daily basis. I'm not a counsellor, I'm the service administrator but I have a um, certificate that says that I'm an accidental counsellor but that's aside from things. Um, regarding the um, institutional abuse, I think one of the things that is not usually discussed is the issue that although there's been institutional cases of abuse, and I think you know the Royal Commission, everything like that is very valid and um, needs to be a process um, of dealing, but by far the most cases of abuse happen in families. The, the statistics are there. So it's like the media has skewed, and um, it has been mentioned that um, you know, there are sections of the media that wants to see the church crucified, so to speak. Um, but I think as communities, it's great that we're having these discussions to bring forth a lot of different aspects of the complex issues, but not to um, own the guilt um, so much so that we're not actually, as communities and as christ sent people, dealing with where the majority of the stuff is happening as well, not just the minority. So it does happen, you know, it's the close relations in family um, relationships and stuff like that where most of the abuse is occurring. So I think, yes, the institutional stuff, great, deal with all that, but, um, you know, Christian communities and people called to ministry need to be looking at how to deal with where it's mostly happening as well. Um, and the second thing that um, I wanted to respond to was about, it was just a little quip where I'm not meaning to contradict or anything, but Neil said, Neil said something about the community being a parachurch organisation. We're not actually really a church in a sense. And I've dealt with most of my life calling a ministry in a parachurch organisation. And I've come to realise, hey, we're not, we're not coming alongside the church. Each one of us is actually part of the body of Christ, which is the church, and there are many different expressions in that, and some of that is in denominations and local communities, but I really feel is that if we're communities of people in Christ, that somehow we are an expression of church. We're not just something coming alongside the church because each one of us is a member of the body of Christ. So whether it's in the Anabaptist, the AAANZ situation, the Bruderhof, um, you know, what I'm involved with in creative arts, I think we create communities of people in many different 
layers and dimensions and that we can be church and community and you know we do provide for people where the institutional uh, expressions have um, become limited perhaps misguided perhaps you know they've lost the gist of what it really means um, to be a sent person um, of God as God sent Jesus Jesus sends us you know we're um, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so but thank you for letting me to contribute so I hope that was worthwhile <laughs> Can I just say one comment on the, the law of the land being in conflict with processes of restorative justice? For one of our teams, which is also in our neighbourhood, but down the road by the church, they do prisoner reintegration. And I think this is more of a challenge for teams like theirs, where they've got guys living with them on probation, and it might be that one of the guys has a slip up and, and smokes some weed or, or takes drugs or even drinks alcohol, which is prohibited on probation for some. That's, those are the complex times because actually the law of the land requires that their probation officer hear about it and it might send them back inside. Sometimes it's if they have a fight as well, like a violent incident, whereas the team might actually feel the best process is to sit together and to have a restorative session, you know, with those guys. So that is an exa a concrete example. But I think um, lots of parents face that. You know, where you find out your teenager's actually been smoking weed. I mean, do you ring the police? Probably not. Like, the law is very rigid, and, and we know as, as humans that there is a sense of, um, you know, sometimes you have to make the judgment call. And so in community, we do that. It wouldn't just be one person making that call. There would be a conversation among the community, as in the committed communal members, to say, OK, this is the process we think best. What, what does everyone else think? And they'd, they'd have a process of, of weighing that up. Yeah, it's so just a concrete example of that. It's a good concrete example, yeah. Uh, there was a question around here somewhere, but that's all right. No. Yes? Oh, Tom. Tom. Oh. Stop. Get on the panel. <laughs> No, go for it, mate. Um, I mean, I, I do want to make a comment on, on, on that last one there before my question. Um, I think it's really quite, um, it could be quite an eye opener for church communities to actually uh, engage with like, local policing and yeah. um, those kind of things. And you might realise that actually. Um, the law is not actually as rigid as we often think it is. Um, there are people in those institutions who, who are very aware of the complexity of the issues um, and who don't want to see things always transpire in court. Uh, so just to be aware, you know, that there's, there's, um, there's people who can help. There is, and, and just to, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, just as an example of that, uh, the church that I once upon a time went to, we had a relationship with our local area command where they would bring in juvenile offenders um, usually really minor stuff, um, but not, al not always. And our job was, you always need a support person present when they are processed. And so they're allowed to be held for four hours uh, in New South Wales. And um, the, there was all, they always, the police always required a support person to be present when they were processed. Usually that was a parent, but sometimes parents didn't want to come for whatever reason. And so we were on a list, um, we had a list of people who were available and the police would call someone on that list and say, we need a support person, blah, blah, blah. And that was a great way for us to have, and I'm sure lots of local area commands around the country would be keen to have that kind of support because otherwise they have to really work hard to, f to come up with a support person. Within that four hour window, they need to make it happen. It's hard work. So that's a definitely an opening for churches in Australia. Can I shift tack now then? Yeah. Um, so I suppose this gathering is, is organised by the Anabaptist Association and it's about being called to community. The Anabaptist tradition now is, you know, um, 500 years old. Um, so I'm, I'm interested um, in, in what other theological impulses in, in today um, that are calling people to the kind of radical discipleship in communities today. So part of my question is, is the Anabaptist tradition still alive and how can it be kept alive? Um, but also where does it need to be aware of other impulses in the wider church theological scene um, that, that actually might breathe fresh winds um, into kind of this, this call that Jesus has on in our life? 
Well, I'd be happy to um, respond to that. And I think the, um, the Plow Magazine is just a great example because if you take that, that issue there, the most recent one, um, the different voices that are in there that, that are, you know, a broad spectrum of some of the best um, current theologies around, um, around discipleship, around what does it mean to be a Christian today. Um, that article on the, the Benedict option is, is just superb because the, the author, um, Rod Dreher, brings in so many streams from history um, indicating that, um, that there is, I would say exactly, not exactly, but a similar ferment in society um, as, as there was in, in Reformation times. Um, and I, I think as I look in, just pick three Western countries, so England or Great Britain, USA and, and Australia, just look at the political dead end in each of those countries. And um, I, I believe that as um, the politics dead ends, um, as the idea that happiness comes from material success dead ends, um, I do believe that at some point there'll be a dead end in terms of what technology will satisfy. Um, these things are the, are the trigger points for a search that becomes more active. So in, in our parents' generation, it was World War II. So that called every single um, person within a certain range to a decision. And uh, the interesting point there is that her, her father um, was in the Navy. My father was in the camps for conscientious objectors. Eventually took a more absolutist stand and, and landed up with nine months prison sentence. Um, and yet, both, both of those streams came eventually to the Bruderhof. And we are definitely seeing, and this is really hopeful and goes directly to your question, uh, worldwide a, a increase in, in people coming and visiting for shorter and longer periods of time. And that, that's my chief indicator of this divine dissatisfaction. So then what, what does Anabaptism have to offer those who are divinely dissatisfied? Um, the same thing it did in the 1500s. And um, there's that beautiful little book, it's on the table back there, Harold Bender's um, The Anabaptist Vision. And, that, and that, that answers that same hunger today. So, um, and that's simply that the, Christ, the Christian walk is a walk of discipleship, so we should, we should actually follow Christ. Um, then this idea that the, the body of believers is a, a brotherhood, a, a, um, something that has corporeal reality. Um, and then the, this idea that Christ taught us to, to be nonviolent in our response across all spectra. And I would say to that um, is basically a pro-life position. So from conception to, to natural death, Anabaptists should uphold the sanctity of life. And all those things resonate with, with issues today. Um, and, and they permeate every area. Now, bio bioethics, uh, you can name any number of ways in which um, technology and, and uh, medicine, all these things have, have progressed to a state where um, man is building towers of Babel all over the place. Um, those will eventually crumble and, and people will be looking for a real answer. Yeah, um, the, the, it's, for me, the whole scene is, is just so mixed. I sense that you know, in so many mainline churches, um, there's been a, a greater move towards justice issues, and, uh, and whilst that's not always uh, um, expressed in terms of peace issues, there is that that movement in the theological trend, I think, uh, across many mainline churches. Um, so that's, 
that's one thing. I think that another thing is what I mentioned earlier on about, about young people. I think there is an orientation in that direction in the, the, the values of the millennials. Um, but then I look at the broader society and I see uh, the, the division that's occurring in our society between you know, ultra-right and ultra-left uh, and uh, you know, the middle ground is definitely hollowing out. And that, that, that's probably an expression of, uh, of um, uh, the, the concerns that people are feeling and the, the search, that they are searching for something and they're thinking that the certainty that's offered by one side or the other uh, is going to satisfy that certainty. Um, but it's still a very confused scene, um, uh, as far as I can tell. Any other questions? I have one. This is, um, comes out of something you were talking about, Kat, on Friday night, but it's, uh, it's for everyone. Uh, it's about dealing with conflict. Um, and so you talked about our need for conflict in the community, and I think we all sort of understand the, that need. But in our societies, uh, and including our churches, people nowadays will do basically anything to avoid pain, including conflict yeah. as, uh, as an expression of uh, often pain. And so we are asking people in a way to enter regularly into forms of pain. Now, of course, pain can be very good for us, uh, as, as, and conflict can be if it's done well. But we aren't in the habit of fostering healthy conflict. Um, so where, where do people and communities who are, we, we sort of have this, such an aversion, where can people learn, you know, start to learn that artful skill of doing conflict and doing it well? I think one of the most important things is to have a dissatisfaction with pretend agreements, we call it in urban vision, where you know you, you pretend to agree, but actually in your guts you feel tuned up. And um, we have a culture, or we try and foster a culture of, of not allowing pretend agreements. And so we, I think the main drive in conflict is, is a search for honesty and truth telling. And it's not saying that one person has that truth and the other doesn't, but it is a genuine commitment together to truly search out truth and to choose to be honest, even when it's really hard. And I think um, in Urban Vision, we're probably not very good at it because we're young as a movement, because we don't necessarily all live in enough proximity with each other that we have to. So I think in human relationships, there's always a certain level of um, just pretense, like just pretending it's all fine. Um, so I think we live in the humility of knowing that we're humans and we get it wrong and we live in, we live in a fallen world, even amongst each other, and that's actually okay because God's big enough to deal with that. But we do have an underlying um, search for truth together and, and honesty. And some, like I cannot live with, with conflict, like I have to get it out. And that's really scary for other members of the team who would rather just pretend it's, not, not even pretend, that's not fair, but who don't feel safe, you know. And it, it is really challenging. But in our team, we, um, people do really appreciate it. And they appreciate that we say sorry and they appreciate that we get it wrong and they get it wrong, but we, we do work it through together. But we always live with a certain level of, yeah, nah. Like, a, I don't want to say a swear word, but, you know, a certain level of just not really, you know, just a little bit of pretending because um, we're human. Yeah. yeah. I think we could certainly identify with that. <laughs> And it's not only young communities that have, <laughs> um, but that is, again, to go to the one rule that we have, that is the core um, issue between us, on which community right stands or falls on, and we promise that we will speak up, um, and we will speak up if we don't agree with something, you know, but 
we're all human and it is hard. It's much simpler to just, you know, let it go. But um, so we, we definitely have the same, same experiences. Can I just say one more thing? It's a desire to make peace as well. So it's one thing to make peace out there in a hurting world, but actually it's a desire to be at peace and to make peace together. Yeah. The desire has to be on both parties, on both sides. It can't just be a one-sided mm -hmm. wanting to make peace. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I was actually brought up to be quiet for the sake of peace. Mm -hmm. You don't say yeah, anything yeah. for the sake of peace. And, you know, that's very damaging yeah. in my eyes yeah. because you, you don't have peace but you have resentment yeah. and all these other issues that, yeah. because you've never been allowed to express what bugs you. Uh, that's a really good point, and because there's there's a real peace and there's a phony peace, yeah. and just as an international conflict, um, you know there may not be guns and missiles flying, but two two countries can be at extreme odds, and so I go back to a marriage relationship because that's that's something that that many are familiar with. It has to start with that commitment that we are committed, come hell or high water that we are committed to each other. There is no other option. Divorce is not an option in our church. Um, leaving one another is not an option. So we, we are committed to make that work. So does that mean midnight sessions? It do, did in our marriage. It does in our marriage. That means the sun's long gone down, but there's still something that needs to be worked out. And, uh, and I can tell you, we've had some fairly robust um, sessions past midnight, but we're committed to it. And we won't rest until there is actual peace. And, and you're absolutely right that the way to actual peace actually goes through conflict, because that stuff has to come out. And, and the other thing is then, so that's, that's us as a, a couple, but around us are brothers and sisters who've made exactly the same commitment to that culture of honesty, to that direct speaking and love, to the humility with which you speak to one another. Do we get it right all the time? Absolutely not. But when you have people alongside you with the same commitment, that does make an enormous difference. And I think that's fundamental to this question. Yeah. For me, the bigger question becomes, um, um, what do you do when uh, you have tried uh, uh, unsuccessfully to uh, to resolve something. Um, in our community, we uh, reaffirm our commitment to the community uh, annually, and we have just done that. And uh, one of our people uh, wrote to me and said that uh, she will be withdrawing from the community uh, because uh, of an unresolved conflict that went back four or five years. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, what do I do with this? Do I just say goodbye on your way? Um, she's been quite active in the community in, in many ways, and so I felt that it would be wrong to, uh, to just let it go. And so I um, thought, well, what do I do? And as I so often do in these matters, I turned to Bonhoeffer, and I, <laughs> I went back and looked at some of the things that he had to say, and ultimately said to her that, well, you know, you really need to work through it. It's not the right thing to be walking away, that conflict is part of community uh, and it needs to be resolved uh, and the initiative lies with each of us and, uh, and uh, you need uh, to examine yourself and you need to do something, even if you feel you're the aggrieved party, you need to do something uh, to reach out and try to get resolution on that. Um, and um, I... I copied this in to uh, one of the people who had been uh, the other party, um, and uh, you know he came back and said that you know he thought we should be letting her go, <laughs> and I then had to go through that with him uh, and explain uh, exactly where I was coming from, even though I thought I'd been very very detailed in my <laughs> earlier response anyway. Um, 
So, you know, you, you try to dot every I and cross every T, and, uh, and I guess it's one of the problems for us, uh, you know, being a dispersed community, we can't even put these people in the same room and get them to come, you know, head to head. Uh, we've got to try and resolve it in other ways. And, uh, the, you know, she, she has now decided to continue with uh, her withdrawal, um, and uh, um, I continue to ponder if there are further steps that I can take. But, uh, you know, it, yeah. Uh, uh, Graham, Graham's had his hand up for a while, so I'll just... It might get very practical as well. Um, like, I think with many different groups, and, you know, there's dancing around different people's sensitivity, so we don't <laughs> affect people, and the person who gets the most offended or has the strongest rules of how life has to be, things can very easily go around dodging around them, and then the more easy going ones can kind of get left behind. But yeah. it's a real concrete thing for me. It's my primary community is, I have a home that has young university students there. I'm terrified of doing conflict. It's been one of the big things in my life that I'm, I'm so scared of doing it. I'll do anything to create peace. I've suffered a lot in my own psyche of giving up of me for the sake of other people and being a sponge to take on other people's problems and all of that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, at the moment, we're, we're in a quite a happy place, but um, there's still a thing of trying to be perfect and, um, you know, if something came up, I would be really scared. Yeah. You know, something small happened the other day and I just sat on it for days. I'm really scared, like, I need to find encouragement in how other people do it. Um, when it's in that everyday stuff mm -hmm. that we learn, you know, that's what our household needs to find a way to learn. Mm -hmm. Not to just when you talk about the what's the word? The false thing you learn. Uh, pretend agreements. No, pretend agreement yeah. is um, you know, I can see us all working really hard to not go near conflict mm -hmm. and not share anything yeah. much. Yeah. Um, and it's lovely that I'm in a space at the moment that you know, for this last year, it was quite a happy place. But before that, I know the tension that you've seen with certain people. It's like, thankfully, university students move on. <laughs> 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 you know, so it gives me a chance to keep on learning. But thing you can put on your fridge that will yeah. give some guidance in that. So I suggest you ask them for their fridge poster. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I would say that um, the foundation of everything is love. So um, if I know a, a, a brother or sister um, will be triggered by something, um, I'm not going to go in there and, and talk about a particular subject or, um, you know, th that will provoke something which might be embedded in their past or, or whatever it is. So in other words, when we're talking about conflict at, to, as a way to peace, that doesn't mean I go around um, hitting everybody's trigger points. You know what I mean? So, so I think it answers your question that, that if there's a basis of, of love overarching everything, I will not um, intentionally go into a space that I know will, will hit a, a trigger point um, because you do get to know people fairly well when you're, you're living close together. And there's that sensitivity built on love, not, not, not dancing on eggshells, but, but on something much firmer than that, and that is love. And I won't, I won't um, knowingly or intentionally cause a hurt, um, you know, that, that may trigger a conflict um, if I know there's a, an area of sensitivity somewhere. Does, does that help answer it a little? I'll go, we'll go to the last one and then you guys can have a say and then we're going to wrap up. Thanks, Matt. Just, um, just really quickly, part of the, um, the gift of conflict is, is bringing our, our whole self to a group of people and bringing our, our whole self to God. And my sense of just spending a little bit of time with you this weekend is that you are someone who, you know, you're not threatening, you're incredibly loving that's very clear and I think actually people in your household they want to know the whole of you and that's really uncomfortable for all of us but it, it's true and that you can bring conflict 
or bring out conflict in a way that is really humble. And I think you are probably someone who does do that and who can do that as you bring yourself and say, I'm really scared right now because I hate conflict. But my feeling is that we need to talk about this thing and let's do it in a way that honours the fact that lots of us right now are feeling really vulnerable and yuck. But let's choose to go there together, knowing that none of us are going to intentionally hurt each other, but that we can actually sit together and talk about this thing in a loving way. And in community with students, often it's the little stuff that drives you nuts. It's the pecking to death by ducks. You know, it's the who's doing the dishes stuff. It's all of that little stuff that if you don't talk about, it will, it will build on up and you, you'll have an explosion. Or everyone will seethe and leave in a way that doesn't feel loving. You know, so I think it is about bringing out our whole life <laughs> to each other. You know, and I actually think you'd probably find that you do that very well. That's just a hunch. Because we've had a few without it, so. All I was going to say is that what you said was right on. Um, but also that I'm thankful for what Graham said because I'm just like that. But um, if we do um, go through that certain conflict that you need to in order to find peace, you end up coming closer to the people that you were distanced from and you become brothers and sisters in a true way. That's it's all. Just, it's just exactly like in a marriage, you know? The best part is making up. After, the, after a, a whole night of war, you know what I mean? Yeah. Too I think, much information there, Bruderhoff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, the, all the married couples right. said, uh, all the couples said amen. So, um, look, uh, I, I found this an incredibly helpful and enriching kind of uh, experience and time and I hope you have too. There's a lot of wisdom here and panels, um, you know, if conflict can be frightening for some people, panels can be too because you have to, you have to answer questions without any preparation. So I thank you so much for all that you shared. Um, my f only parting encouragement on the conflict stuff was I was at a conference a couple of years back in Melbourne and there was a Victorian community that was there, quite well known, uh, Christian community, and they were doing a session on uh, non-violence and conflict, and uh, some of the most humble people you've ever met, and then at one point they started talking about how two of the guys had gotten into a fist fight once and <laughs> in the community, and we all felt a lot better after that, so, uh, um, so that, was, that was quite nice. So, uh, <laughs> thank God for violence. Yeah, thank, go thank goodness for punch-ups. Um, well, I, I just wanted to get Tom to come up uh, so that we can say thank you to all of our keynote speakers. Have we got that? We do. Um, I Also, if she was here, she would be here. Um, but Larissa uh, is, has fallen ill this morning, which is why she's not here. She was going to come back, but she messaged me quite early to say I'm not feeling well. So... Um, with, we're thankful for Larissa's um, contribution and I'll have to get her gift to her. Um, but we just wanted to say thank you to you all. Um, you've all travelled a decent way to come here. Um, and, you know, I've been bugging you all for some weeks about all sorts of little things that I need and you've all been incredibly gracious uh, and willing to help me out. Uh, but more than any of that, you uh, have... You, you, you live a life uh, that supports what you've said. And sure, it's not perfect like you, like you are all human, but you, you try to walk the walk before you talk the talk, which is why we invited you. And we are, as I've, I've been saying this incessantly, I know, but we're thankful for your wisdom and uh, all that you've imparted to us. And we believe that God has spoken through you in some way. The Spirit has spoken in our hearts. And we believe that will change us as individuals and as uh, people from communities and as a, as a network of Anabaptists in Australia and New Zealand. And so thank you so much. And this is, these are just a small token of our appreciation uh, for you coming and sharing with us. So would you... Say thank you.
We also have some other people, sorry, just to say there's been some other people who have been uh, very uh, important in making this conference happen. So I want to say thank you to Sally, wherever Sally is. <laughs> Um, for leading us so wonderfully uh, in our devotional times um, and, and I know I keep using this word but with so much wisdom uh, in how that was to be done because it's a, it is a diverse group and to make it work can be quite difficult so thank you. Uh, for Anna, uh, for leading us in music, Anna, um, the, the songs that we've sung Anna did not know uh, before the conference and had to learn them and fairly quickly I might add um, so thank you so much for taking the time and coming out from Bathurst and and bringing some of the equipment that we needed as well thank you uh, and Anton I, I, how did I forget <laughs> so if you're watching this on the stream we're thanking the person who has made it possible for you to be here uh, Enton has travelled by far the furthest uh, and we are thankful to him uh, and, and for his not only uh, taking the time to do this but to make it possible as well technologically. I know we talked about technology but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we would have been up the creek I think without Enton uh, making that happen. So, and we also give thanks to the brethren uh, for f not only freeing up... Um, uh, Enton, but making it free uh, cost-wise for him to come for us. <laughs> they made it possible uh, financially. And so the last person we're going to thank is not in the room, is Fiona. So we are all going to give a huge thanks to Fiona when we go out to morning tea in just a moment, okay? Because uh, Fiona has, I don't know if you've noticed, she's not been in many sessions because there's been a lot of food prep to do. Um, so we're thankful for that. The only other thing we're going to do at, at morning tea is take a photo together. I, I was silly enough to forget that yesterday, and so we, we are missing the, the day visitors from yesterday, but we will just have to take a photo with the, with the current crew. But we will uh, do that out in probably on the stairs leading down to the thing, so we're tiered, um, but somebody will direct you in that. Uh, go enjoy morning tea, and in about... Before we go, I just want to say thank you very much for the warmth uh, and the acceptance that uh, you've given me and Margaret. Um, uh, doing this kind of thing is not my, my favourite uh, <laughs> kind of thing that I like to do, uh, but uh, the warmth and the acceptance and the, 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 the companionship uh, that I've experienced has been fantastic. So uh, thank you very much. That, that was all I was going to say as well. And Good. thank you so much, yeah. Matt, and everybody for the tremendous amount of work involved. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Matt, Mark, and Mary. Well, uh, the other person also is Shane. So Shane was on the organising crew as well um, and has not enjoyed as much of the conference because of uh, being quite ill. But he's here with us now and that's, that matters. So why don't we go and enjoy morning tea?